is uh, Erica with Beats That Set My Pulse here at Beta Wave Studios. And I am with the beautiful, talented Jess Jones, also a great friend. And this is podcast number five. So welcome, Jess. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming up. Um, what's really interesting is that uh, I recall back the first time that I met you, although we didn't necessarily have sort of profound conversations, but was at, at uh, Moonrise, Moonrise 3, which we know is an event curated by um, the founders of Beta Wave, so Matt Faulkner. And uh, I just thought that was really cool kind of coming full circle now being in their <laughs> studio. Here we are. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, but for you, it's been, uh, I mean, that was sort of maybe early on when you had moved here because you said you're coming about five years of L.A., being in L.A.? Just about, yeah. Okay. Okay. And so uh, you're, you know, I guess take us through maybe why you moved here and, you know, sort of uh, your hometown and what that means <laughs> to you. Sure. Um, from upstate New York, outside of Albany. Um, I went to school in upstate New York, and then I had to do an internship for credit. Okay. And I kind of only applied to two internships thinking I was going to get the one in New Jersey. And I was like, oh, I got this one. And I applied to one in L.A., like kind of just for fun. Yeah. And then I didn't get the one in Jersey and I only got the one in L.A. And I was like, oh, crap, I guess I got to go. Rolling the, <laughs> rolling the dice, um, oh which is funny because it's like, you know, that ended up becoming a song of yeah. yours. Um, I love that. Uh, well, yeah, then all like arrows pointed to Los Angeles, which I always joke is sort of the center of the universe, um, especially when you think about, you know, creative artists and creative like, I don't know, groundswell. Um, but, uh, well, it's really impressive because I feel um, you already know a ton of, platforms you know that you can utilize like for integrating into the scene and um you know a ton of like friends and people know of your music and so um yeah it seems like you've integrated very well and um in terms of neighborhoods it's usually like echo park area or silver lake that i see you in but you at least i know you recently you know moved to san diego because of the pandemic but when um when in LA, you were in Sherman Oaks. So you weren't in the thick of it, but you were still dedicated, which I thought was awesome. And I would see you at a lot of shows. <laughs> and um, and it was great, too. I, I remember um, it was earlier this year in February that you played Monday Monday mm -hmm. at Hotel Cafe. And um, I really loved that. Because honestly, that was the first time I've ever seen you play live <laughs> in more of a formal setting. Mm -hmm. I, I always think, you know, I'm spoiled in that you played for me, at, you know, like at the campfire trips that we've been on, but a more formal setting. And that was really lovely. And um, I know that when I came into that, I had already known the lyrics to Souvenir, which is my favorite song of yours so far. <laughs> um, and that was because the fine gentleman, Taylor Hungerford of Tarn Flowers, was all like, you know, to our friend group, have you heard of Jess's song Souvenir? And he's like, it's a good one. And I just remember putting that on and I was like, whoa. Because um, it definitely like hit home with me. Um, yeah, so, you know, in terms of that song, uh, what inspired that? Um, basically, I did like kind of a solo road trip a little bit. Up, okay. Um, from, I was, at the time I was in Arcata, California. Okay. And... I was just like in this little Airbnb, like in the middle of the woods. And like, I kind of like finally felt a sense of like freedom and just like serenity. And I was like, I can write, you know, I just felt nice. like so like it just seemed so easy. And like, I literally wrote it in probably like an hour. And it was wow. kind of about that feeling of just driving and being on your own, that freedom. Mm -hmm. And like, it's kind of just how I always feel is just like being kind of nomadic and always being. Yeah. Um, that's funny because I, I very much sort of embrace the nomadic lifestyle as well. Um, you know, we'll joke sometimes that I'm tumbleweed. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I, and I was just, I don't know why I was randomly thinking this, but you have a tattoo of a thistle. I do. <laughs> yes. Is that, is that supposed to be representative of kind of like a tumbleweed or is that more associated with desert and connection with um, desert? Or? It's associated with Scotland. It's like oh. their flower and oh. my great grandma's from Scotland. Oh, so right. me and my sister actually got. Very nice. So neither. And it's like, shame on me. I actually used to go to Scotland when I lived in London, and I, I've i even been to some festivals out there and stuff. Damn, well, that's beautiful. Um, but, yeah, so I have the lyrics to Souvenir, which, oops, which uh, I think are worth uh, bringing up. Um, so I got a destination, but I don't know it yet. 
which again is embracing the wanderlust because it's you know if you're willing to kind of follow your bliss usually you find that um those destinations that you were meant to uh see or the detours you were meant to go down they will present themselves and i love that um loop on 65 it's all about the drive i want to take something away from this place um I want a souvenir to prove that I was here, but no keychain made in China. Uh, I want a memory. I love that line because it's like kind of cheeky. You know, I mean, <laughs> most people will get keychains that are made in China when they go places. <laughs> but I love that you're like, no, I want something. And maybe it's not necessarily like a tangible, but it's something more, I don't know. Uh, like an experience. Experience, yeah. And kind of something, again, that's kind of even more like visceral, visceral and maybe... Um, what should I say, summons like a sort of emotion or something like you were saying. Um, so yes, it is an amazing driving song and I guarantee you any road trip. In fact, that should, if there's any Spotify playlists that are like road trip driving, <laughs> that better be on there. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, I love that song. And, um, and then kind of hand in hand with that, uh, Home Ain't Here, which also was one of the songs you played on that Monday, Monday set. I thought it was really nice, uh, I, I thought it was a song that I think a lot of, you know, people that live in L.A. that are transplants can resonate with and sort of, um, I don't know, uh, I don't want to say empathize, but they can sort of like take on this feeling of I don't know what to call home, but I um, but I know it ain't here. This idea that, um, yeah, maybe aspects of um, of Los Angeles, you know, you're driven to, but still there's like this this it doesn't have that comprehensive feeling of home maybe that you thought it would have. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that was, I was just saying, I think it's very relevant to a city like, you know, La La Land. Um, and then um, another song, like sort of along that line, the, ro the roll the dice that I was recently mentioning, the line is, uh, one of the lines that I really sort of like spoke to me was, should I give up and just go home? Um, so it seems like... Uh, a few of your songs kind of have this common theme of you sort of like perseverating back and forth and you're maybe like, I don't know, love connection and you <laughs> dating Los Angeles. But do you think eventually you will see yourself like being more rooted here? Honestly, no. Okay. <laughs> to be completely honest. Okay. There's just this energy of LA that's a little much, you okay. know, I do kind of always dream about a little hippie hideaway in Topanga. Like, yeah. I'm not saying that's out of the question. Yeah. I could definitely see that as a possibility. Maybe like Ojai too. I've no. never been, so. I don't, I don't okay. Oh, that's a new. That's a trip <laughs> we need to to go on together. Yeah. Nice. Okay. But maybe somewhere with seasons eventually. You know, okay. I love the sunshine, but it's also like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I guess another thing I was going to mention, um, you know, aside from doing music, you've also taken on surfing. Mm -hmm. So maybe somewhere where you could still yeah, do that. Yeah, I like have coastal. a hard time thinking of leaving the beach the behind. Beach, I'm yeah. like, Colorado seems like a really dope place. But then I'm like, the beach is so far. It is far. <laughs> yeah, that's why he's saying coastal. Um, yeah. Um, but no, that's interesting to know. Um, but anyway, you know, embracing the wanderlust, I think, is always good. And um, because Los Angeles, you know, tends to have a lot of diversity and and. Um, should I say even just kind of like distractions in the sense that outside of quarantine, there was always something to do. Mm -hmm. You have to like pull yourself away from that. It's almost like a suction cup. It's like <laughs> keeping you and you're like, no, but there's actually so many more amazing places that I have to get to. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so you have to almost like work harder to get yourself out of Los Angeles. Um, and I know that it was the, the summer of 2019 that you took a nice, um, sort of, um, summer stay back uh, upstate New York mm -hmm. and uh, and then played a little bit, like did a little bit of a tour. But did you find that that um, kind of isolation period was helpful and conducive to writing? I think it was, um, but I think the thing that helped me the most was I worked at a venue and I got to see all of these bands that I'd never really mm. thought about seeing. And then seeing them and seeing the crowds was the other thing, seeing the people that came to the shows. I really got to like crowd watch and be like, what do I want my crowd to be? And then, like, Ooh. I should make music like that to draw this kind of energy and not the other kind, yeah. you know? So, like, it was lots of learning. And so I definitely uh, learned a lot that summer about what kind of sound I want to go for and who I want to play to. Nice. Um, but, like, what kind of crowds I would like to draw with nice. my music. 
Was there any band in particular that um, had the crowd that you really wanted? Yeah, I mean, this is like a long shot, like never gonna happen. But um, Dead and Co. Oh, like, okay, because they like, had like if you that? can fill twenty thousand people, you're doing something right. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, they just man. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I mean, again, if this pandemic didn't happen, I know that we were discussing. Uh, well, Katie and I were discussing maybe flying out um, if there, you know, a summer festival where Dead and Co was playing in New York to kind yeah, of yeah, they were gonna it. play in August. <laughs> yeah, in August and experience yeah. it there. Um, cause again, they have a very dedicated following, I feel like in the sort of, um, New England area and, mm -hmm. um, well, very nice. Well, how <laughs> about maybe, um, a notch below that? <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other bands or? Oh, uh, let's see. Um, Cage the Elephant, they just put on a wild show, you yeah. know, I was like, if I can give a show like they gave, like, yeah. that would be pretty dope yeah so they these, were just so entertaining so this was a bigger venue then it was yeah it okay. was kind of like hollywood bowl except a little bit like they can fit like i think twenty two thousand is wow. the cap wow okay makes me think of like i don't know why but it, just because of his performance at hollywood bowl was amazing was um gary clark jr he's another one that is just like holy shit <laughs> um and uh suzanne santo actually in honey honey which is a more local la band she lives in silver lake she plays with him but um Anyway, very nice. Um, and um, there was another thing I was going to ask about. Oh, and also, I guess if bands came through from different locations, you could also maybe, um, it might, like, reawake your knowledge about a certain style of music coming from a certain part of the U.S. that maybe you weren't aware of. Because, mm -hmm. again, like you mentioned Colorado, and I saw a show there, but it was an L.A. band. It was... <laughs> um, uh, Run River North, but I actually haven't seen like local uh, Colorado music and Telluride has always been something that for me I was like well that maybe is you know a dream in some regard because I know that it's drawing more of the kind of local style mm -hmm. um, but uh, okay very nice and uh, well just even in terms of you know now that we're talking about different bands that maybe have inspired you um, are there what yeah, so maybe what would be a dream collaborator? I would say, like, there's a lot, you know, there's a long yeah. list, but living, I think I would go with John Mayer. Okay, very nice. <laughs> and I remember it was actually when um, I was going to see um, DeBronco, uh, Dario Bronze Band, at Little Joy, you were wearing a John Mayer shirt. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it was, like, very nice. And I said, my friend is really obsessed with John Mayer. <laughs> and um, and uh, I was referring to Kate, Katie Marks. But... Um, but then I know that we started to discuss like what types of songs and stuff you really liked of his and, um, yeah, very nice. So do you prefer more of his, um, kind of acoustic style or like more of the electric guitar style or is it? I really like his bluesy style. Bluesy like stuff. when he kind of borrows from Hendrix and yeah. Stevie and I'm just like, mm, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> and I think, um, um, what really, uh, you know, sort of elevated his kind of status in my mind is when, you know, legends like Eric Clapton really uh, gave him mad props. And uh, it was just like, all right, like he's doing something. <laughs> he's, <yeah. laughs> he's doing something right. Mm -hmm. this, guy, this guy ain't no amateur, you know. <laughs> um, so very cool. Well, maybe one of these days. Um, we will spot him right. because got to hang out in Montana. Well, <laughs> well and also I, I know Annabelle Lee had posted stories on her um, Instagram. Also, she's a very um, talented artist, but she had posted stories when he was playing at um, Hotel Cafe. And he's known to play with David Ryan Harris, who um, lives in Mount Washington area. And who, funny enough, I, when I was looking back on his Instagram, I saw that um, Rhett Madison opened for him at some venue in like Venice or something two years ago. And I was like, damn, you know, if you think about the connections, you're not that many, yeah. one way. Well, you're not, yeah, the degrees of separation not, are not that far. So it's not impossible. Um, well, very nice. And, um, you know, speaking of the John Mayer, which I thought was so cool is uh, for Caitlin Marks, you know, because she's a big John Mayer fan, um, you learned Queen of California. Uh, alongside um, Elton John's Yellow Brick Road and then Tom Petty's Wild Fla Flowers for her to ambush her on her birthday. Um, and that was amazing. Uh, executed beautifully. And I know she was like nearly in tears. Um, and you did that in like a week. Uh, so how, how do you learn covers so quickly? It's I don't have a memorized. 
Yeah. 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 Um, but I usually watch like YouTube tutorials. Okay. Or if it's simple enough. If I just look up the chords and if okay. I hear, if I know the song, it's a lot easier. If I don't know the song, like I actually didn't know Queen of California, so I had to listen to it a few times and okay. be like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Very nice. Well, we would have never known. Um, <laughs> And then the other thing I was going to say, just in covers in general, like you seem to be this guru with covers and you can learn them pretty quickly. And that was one of the things that you mentioned. Um, I think you mentioned when we were actually at Pappy's watching some little, you mentioned, oh, yeah, the place, the brewery that, um, you know, I tend to play covers uh at our, our, it was around the the area, and um, is it like Redlands Brewery or something? Yeah, it was Hangar Twenty Four. Oh, Hangar Twenty Four. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and so how many covers would you say you know? Um, at least two hundred, and that number's growing. Wow, that is nuts. That's amazing. <laughs> Holy shit! There was a time I wanted to do cruise ship gigs, and they're like, must have at least one hundred fifty. You know, so I'm like, yeah, I gotta go learn me some more wow. covers. But even that doesn't seem like a lot when you look at it on paper. You know, it's mm. only one or two of like, there's so many songs out there. Wow, wow, that's so amazing. Um, and I was going to, I had a point about the covers. Well, I also thought that that probably helped you improve your guitar skills. And I think, again, between, you know, our uh, groups of friends that tend to be comp- comprised majority of musicians, they'll always give you uh, a shout out for having really adroit guitar skills. Um, and for me, I was wondering if learning covers was a way that you've maybe improved your guitar skills. Is it something that Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially when you play the same covers over and over again. The boring ones are the ones where you just strum chords. They're like, yeah. okay, I could do this all day, but it's boring. Yeah. So I like songs like by John Mayer and ones that have like a little more intricate like picking or fingerings yeah. that like keep it interesting. And like I'm excited to play them because I'm like, oh, I actually worked to learn yeah. this one. I didn't just pick up and strum yeah. some chords. So it's more satisfying. So on that note, what cover might have been the most difficult to learn? Ooh. Um... Hmm. I mean, I was learning Hendrix covers recently, yeah. so those are definitely yeah. the hardest um, because they're just, like, really in-depth and lots of, like, um, just, like, fast little licks that you kind of just have to yeah. know when you go there, you know? Yeah. Um, and just moving up and down the fretboard more is something I didn't get into for a while, so that yeah. was something I had to, like, work on, like, kind of just, like, memorizing that feel yeah. of where I'm going because sometimes if I'm not looking down, I'm like... Ooh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and you also know, so I guess acoustic, but then you play on electric. Um, and do you prefer a certain? Um, well, when I was like a teenager, I wanted to play electric. And mm-hmm. then I fell into acoustic because I studied classical mm-hmm. in college. So I was like, oh, I have this finger picking knowledge. I should use that. Yeah. But then like I learned most finger picking and I was like, all right, this is cool. I'm ready to like move on. You know, like yeah. I think there's a lot more ground to cover with electric just because you have all the pedals you can have, all the bending, yes. all the like tasty things you can add. Yes. It's just, so I'm definitely diving down the rabbit hole of electric nowadays. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. Fun. And it's funny because I remember you, um, you were asking about pedals and you, you were saying, you know, the one pedal where it's like, it almost puts it in reverse. Um, the note, like, and I just love that that's something that you want to experiment with. Um, yeah, well, and then the other thing, okay, so you mentioned your fast finger-picking skills, and that was one of the things that um, when you played mandolin, uh, that time we did a trip to June Lake with Sean Forte, uh, also an incredible musician from that Natural Supernatural, he was so impressed by, because <laughs> um, it's like, because the, it's the um, is it's tinier, right? Yeah, I mean, and it has double strings, so you're pushing down two strings at once, ah, so it's a little right. tough. It's like... The 12-string guitar was made to be like a mandolin, so it's kind Got of it. similar. Okay. All right. Very nice. Do you think, you know, you'll sort of s- stop there and perfect those, or is there anything else you'd want to learn? I'm trying to get better at piano. Okay. Um, I'd like to be able to know my way around it a little better. Yeah. And then I'd love to be able to be somewhat competent behind a drum set okay. one, of the, one of these days. Just, okay. you know, so I could... In a pinch, be like, all right, I got you, but... Yeah, maybe you can have our friend uh, Greg Satino show yeah. you around. Yeah. <laughs> Bang on some skins. Love that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I feel like, you know, yeah, with percussion, I mean, it's always nice to kind of even just know, like, all the instruments that go into a song production, just mm-hmm. so that you can maybe be more sort of armed to, I don't know, 
do things yourself on the fly. If, um, and that's, you know, you having the fundamental piano uh, background. So I think I recall you saying that you started learning piano when you were five. Yeah, that must just have been... for like a year. But then I had to retake it in college. So then I actually had to okay. <laughs> okay. practice. Um, and sometimes people will always say the trust the sorry, the test of a true master is if you can teach the art, <laughs> right? So would you ever teach guitar or piano? Yeah, I've been teaching guitar. I did it for a year at Guitar Center. Um, right. and then I'm going to start doing them over Zoom, which I'm a little reluctant because I hate hearing sounds out of speaker. Like I want to hear it acoustically. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure vice versa. It's not going to sound that great on the other end. But um, yeah, I've taught guitar for a while. I have um, a YouTube channel where I teach mandolin because um, mm. it's hard to find mandolin students. I always offered it, but yeah. didn't find many students. But they all go on YouTube, apparently. Nice. Uh, so I have that. I did some ukulele lessons, um, okay. voice, and then I'm going to start teaching piano, but very, very beginner piano. Very nice. How, how did the um, piano opportunity come about? to teach um it's i guess they're twin sisters and one wanted guitar and one wanted piano so i'll just do oh, both very it's easier. nice <laughs> well and maybe that's a silver lining in this whole pandemic where you're forced forced to use virtual means because it opens up your sort of um i don't know you know kind of tutor audience or your reach like you know mm. you could tutor somebody on the east coast now <laughs> you're not sort of even though, like you said, he hearing it through the speakers is not the same. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and maybe you'll have some students that'll bring you new covers to learn jazz. That's it, a thing. Yeah. yeah. When I was at Guitar Center, they'd be like, I want to learn this song. And I'm like, what? What is this song? <laughs> and then I'd look it up and I was like, oh, this is a good this song. This is cool. Yeah. It's or, a, you know, I was always finding new things for yeah. the students. So that's like, cool. Like how the people will sort of broaden your inventory of, uh, mm -hmm. of artists. Um, it helps with my covers too, because if someone wants to learn it, it means other people want to hear it. So having that in my repertoire was really good. Like exactly. I learned lots of Ed Sheeran. <laughs> <Very> <laughs> seemed nice. to be popular. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe like you could learn something that maybe, um, who knows, was more of like a pop or hip hop, but you're putting like a different flair on it. Who knows? I guess the sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. Um, is there, are there covers that you would play like during, um, I don't know, your own set? So if you had to pick maybe like your most favorite ones that you would ever play on your own, mm -hmm. what, what would maybe those be? I always gravitate towards the Beatles. Like I love oh. Dear Prudence. That's one I just play all the time. Um, but also I love While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Okay. Yes. I remember <laughs> I, I saw a video of you doing that and I was like, holy yeah. smokes. And really I've been good. trying to do some dead covers just because there's lots of room for improvisation. So mm -hmm. it can be more of my own. Because that's one thing I struggle with is trying to make a cover sound like my song. Like trying to yeah. make it more me and not just like me playing that cover. Put your stamp on it. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things you mentioned is vocals. And I think you have such a beautiful voice. Um, and you can go very high. Uh, is that something you knew you always had like when did that come into the picture you said piano at five when did you discover your voice I mean I always had it you know yeah. especially like in elementary school I was always like signing up for solos in the choir yeah. and like I did sing in the church choir when okay. I was a kid um and then I was in like musicals in high school okay. and then in college I actually auditioned for voice Oh. I wasn't sure what I wanted to study and I was like I'll audition and if I get in I'll go mm -hmm. and I got in so I studied voice um, in college and then just kept at it. Nice. Um, are there any like, m you know, male, uh, artists that maybe are in sort of our Echo Park Silver Lake scene that you think your vocals might harmonize nicely with? I never really thought about that, yeah. but I know like, I love Daniel Blake's voice. So I think yeah. if my, I don't know if mine would fit well, but I would love to harmonize. That's with cool. His yeah, you know, and the only reason why I think I thought of that is because I had Alicia Blue as one of my guests, and she has done harmonies with Sean Fleming, who I know is our friend and um, such a talented musician. So, um, yeah, those are really nice to hear. And sometimes it's like, unless you're hanging out at maybe one of my house parties or something, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't notice, like, oh, actually, our voices kind of work nice together. Mm -hmm. um, one of the pairings I think works really nicely uh, is you and Sean Forte with... Uh, you know, just his guitar skills. And it's really nice that 
Um, I think after that June Lake, um, <laughs> where you guys, you were on mandolin and he was on guitar and singing, that you realized like, whoa, like maybe we could do this more often. And then um, I know during COVID you started jamming and then he came on board with um, kind of a newer project, Shambhala. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe walk us through like how did that all come yeah. to be? I'd been wanting to do a band for a while, like even okay. pre-COVID and then I was actually meeting with Greg a lot and just kind of jamming out. And then like he was giving me, we called it drum trash. <laughs> like he would just <laughs> nice. send me an audio file, of some beat, and I'd be like, nice. And I would yeah. just try to come up with something to go with it. And then I had a couple songs and then I brought it to Sean. And then he actually, I stole like his drummer and his friend that Chris. played bass. And yeah. like we only jammed once and then we performed and Everyone thought we were, like, a real thing. They were like, wait, you mean you just had one rehearsal? <laughs> that's nuts. That's yeah. nuts. Well, that's what I, I really admire about both you and Sean. Like, even when we might be at, like, one of my house parties or at um, a campsite gathering, you don't mind playing in front of our friends and just kind of, like, dabbling and, and experimenting. But I've noticed there's some others in our friend groups where they're more um, reserved and I think more, um, I don't know, it's sort of, like... Uh, <sighs> The, the opinion of others they're more sort of nervous about and mm -hmm. sort of there's this like intrepid kind of, I guess, uh, concern about what um, what others might think of them. But you and Sean are very fluid and Taylor as well and don't mind trying things out and, um, and also really drawn to the jam, you know, <laughs> which not everybody is, again, comfortable because it's just, it's a lot more experimentation and, um, but you and Sean do it beautifully. It took me a little while. Like I used to be, because I studied music, I was used to having it on a piece of paper in front of me. Yeah. So like you take that away and I'm like, yeah, what do I you don't know how to play anything. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's nice. I mean, and, um, like the fact, and even like, you know, Sean Forte with his band, they had only played like, I think like three or four times and people are just like, what? This is like your third time playing. I really love that sort of like, I don't know, tenacity and kind of audacity uh, to just attack and to be like, hey, you know, <laughs> if we like fuck up some notes, whatever, you know, but, <laughs> but it's almost like the benefits of some of the magic that might manifest from just fooling around in a way like outweighs some of the silly little mistakes of like getting notes wrong or something like that. So, well, that's really impressive. Um, yeah, and I, uh, you know, wasn't able to make that one live, but I'm really excited for when things eventually open up and see you guys together. Do you think you'd ever release music as Shambhala or? Um, I could, like, I could definitely see that happening. I'd want it to be like a full project, like an album, not just like, here's a song, there's a song. Yeah. Like, it'll be like a more thought out, ruminated, tried and true, like, because I want to test it live a lot of times and like mm -hmm. make sure that people are picking it up when I'm putting down to yeah. make it worth putting out there for the masses. Yeah. Um, but that, yeah, that's definitely something I see. That makes sense. That's awesome. Um, I was going to say, um, yeah, you know, and, and songwriting too. I mean, just going back to some of your songs, I, I mentioned the souvenir, um, uh, Home ain't here, same thing. Uh, I didn't mention the one, I don't date in L.A., which was really funny, the line, uh, I don't date, um, I'm in L.A., you can't trust those pretty boys. Um, I do think that there's a lot of truth in that. But um, but I, uh, in terms of songwriting, again, I, I, I think you, uh, beautiful words, and it's like you really feel, like vis visually with Souvenir, like I felt like I was on 65 driving with you, you know, which, mm -hmm. um, but um, we mentioned some artists that you're inspired by and maybe you would ideally want to play with, what, but what about even just like songwriting style? Is there anybody that, I don't know, you're like, I want to learn to um, write songs that maybe, again, are more uh, visual or mm -hmm. are there? Yeah, I want to like, Again, this is far fetched, but like Hendrix, you know, like some yeah. of his lyrics, it's like, where do they even come? They're so yeah. descriptive, descri ah, descriptive, yeah. and like so imaginary. Like he'll say like colors and words, and you're just like, whoa! Yeah. Like they paint a picture, but also like his songs. Like I always think, like he sends it. You know, like yeah. they start in one place, and then like they transport you, and you're kind of you don't know where you're going, and it's like a little yeah. adventure. It's taking you further than where you started like I yeah. want a song that kind of transports you and like you don't have an expectation of oh I can tell where the song is ending you're like I don't yeah. know where the song's going like <laughs> yeah that's all it's always like the tease it's a roller coaster right mm -hmm. you're like you're like Ooh, I'm going uphill and then you're like fuck now I'm downhill like where am I <laughs> yeah no I I really like songs like that um 
uh, one of the things, oh, I was just going to say your process. So I did have the honor of seeing you had like a, a journal with some <laughs> lyrics. Yeah. Yeah. So we took a nice trip up to um, Tahoe and you were testing out your Slab City one. Yeah. Because you had just, I guess, visited Slab City. So you mm -hmm. were inspired by it. That song's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Where's that? Is that going to maybe um, come into recording? Or? It could. I mean, it's a simple little jam that's fun to play live and like. Yeah. It could, it could make but it's it's also witty, um, <laughs> and I like that. Uh, like there was something about a dollar, wasn't it? Like a, oh yeah, they had beers for a dollar, so it was called Slab City Dollar. That's right. And a dollar is gonna buy me a beer. And a dollar is gonna <laughs> buy me a beer. I like that. Yeah. 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 That might not be the one that's like taking us into another orbit, but it's still, <laughs> but it's still a really good one. You know, it's like yeah. it's. I mean, again, people want to sing along. Like that would be one where people would be singing along to that chorus, and it's just like we all want to be part of the. You know, especially, again, playing to masses and stuff. Um, so, uh, and what about um, the desert? It's like, would you ever write, because I know how, um, even though, so, okay, so we did meet in the desert at the moonrise, but we didn't necessarily connect on such a profound level. But I think what really solidified our friendship is when we went to um, Joshua Tree and stayed at an Airbnb. It was like a dozen of us. Um, and I think even with Sean Forte, that was uh, what solidified a friendship. And even me with um, Taylor of Tar and Flowers. But we were going to see Kolar's and the Soft White 60s in December of last year. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were just all coming to the agreement that there's something magical about the desert. Like, you know, why isn't it that we don't necessarily feel this magical bond when we're in <laughs> LA, you know? And mm -hmm. um, so would you ever write a song that's kind of a tribute to the desert because of just like, you know. I'd write a whole album. I okay, freaking love it nice. out there. Yeah, yeah. I would just go like get myself a little spot in the desert and just write for weeks. Yeah. Like, that's definitely something I see myself doing one of these days. Well, interestingly enough, Matt Adams of the Blank Tape, he lives in um, like Pioneer Town area and he wrote a few songs about the desert. So it's like, you know, I obviously I think this sort of sort sort of common consistent observation people have had, but um yeah, I think that would be really nice. Um, and then eventually play at Pappy's. Yes. Is that <laughs> oh, my God. That's a, a dream, dream. <laughs> right? Yeah. I thought it was really cool. So, okay, so, yeah, so the, the Kolar's and Soft White 60s. But then what solidified the friendship even more is more recently, February of this year, Valentine's Day, we saw Lauren Ruth Ward's show. It was a Friday night. And, um, and we... We only had the Airbnb for that one night, mm -hmm. and I know we weren't even necessarily planning to stay the next day, um, but uh, the Friday night kind of around where the merch area is, I saw this guy with a hoodie, and I thought that he was part of the um, the crew, but it turned out that he was Sun Little, Aaron of Sun Little, and uh, that he was going to be playing the following night. And I remember we were talking about pedals with Matt Lanesh, Linny, and uh, that was when he was like, you should come to our show tomorrow night. And I'm like... Oh, getting a personal invitation and the little did I know how amazing he was and how relatively big he was that is it is such an embarrassment for me that um he kind of slipped under the radar and I was not aware of who he was but regardless what I thought was so cool and again what I really adore about you is that you are this sort of like wanderlust and fluid person and very spontaneous and you were willing to stay um that weekend I think the only other person that stayed was Sean Fleming um, and our friend Jeff, who's not a musician, but, uh, and Sean was staying to just have his own kind of Joshua Tree <laughs> isolation. But it was just like, yeah, like, all right, let's just see where this weekend takes us. Mm -hmm. And so, like, fast forward, it takes us listening to Sun Little's um, set, which was amazing, although a bit frustrating that it started late. But then <laughs> we ended up, like, chatting, hanging with him, and then being invited into the green room at Pappy's, which, had you ever been into the green room no. before? No, either had I. It was this alleged green room that, like, I always wanted to know about. <laughs> I'm like, where the fuck? What I didn't realize, it's like a little mini house. Yeah. It's like an annex. It's like a separate annex. And, um, I mean, you sleep there. It's like there's a bedroom and a kitchen and everything. And stayed, like, hanging with the band, um, and then... Uh, it must have been, I don't know, like nine other people that were fans listening, spinning vinyl and dancing to vinyl until like three, four in the morning mm -hmm. uh, and staying there, too, of course. But it was just like you were one of the only people that would be on like uh, on the ride, you know, or I should say willing to go on that kind of ride. Mm -hmm. And that's like really what I one of the things I really adore about you. Um, 
Not that, you know, you don't necessarily have plans, but like sometimes the no plan plan is the best plan, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And um, and certainly that weekend it was. Yeah. And what's so. We were going to sleep in our cars. I remember that's like, right. Well, just rough it. That's right. It was like, and Sean Feldman was like, I'm pretty sure you can like sleep in the car in the parking lot. We're like, shit, okay. Like, <laughs> all right. And it was a little bit chillier because it was um, mm. February, but uh, but it was just absolutely nuts. And. Um, and what's so interesting, too, is that Brandon Eugene Owens, the bassist, um, he, his brother, like, Ike, is, was, a re- was a really big, unfortunately, he passed away, but was a really, um, like, acclaimed musician and had played with, like, Jack White. And, um, but Brandon ended up, we ended up seeing him at the... Um, Moses What's, Sumney? The Moses Sumney, yeah, residency um, at the bootleg, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, what? Like, so cool, um, coming full circle. Um, and um, so anyway, I guess the uh, going back to your statement about playing at Pappy's, what was so, um, I don't know, just shocking and mind-blowing to me is that Aaron of Sun Little said that Pappy's was in his mind one of the most special venues and he's played at like Red Rocks, which I've actually never um, been to, but I'd love to eventually see a show there. But I was like, holy shit, like somebody, you know, such an inclined musician like him who's literally toured all over the over the world. And he's going to say that Pappy's was one of the most like idyllic, you know, endearing venues. And it's like, hell, this is in our backyard. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, before the pandemic, we were probably going there maybe a frequency of like once every two months or something like that. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I think that's so nice, you know, as a local musician, it's like having, you know, aspirations to do that and, and the likelihood of a, it like happening down the line. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's really cool. Um, and the other thing I was going to say about coming full circle, oh, was also that um, you were planning to have a really cool musical birthday party. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, Brandon um, was likely going to come. Uh, but then couldn't because he had to go up to like, I think Livermore that weekend, but it's like, how freaking cool is that? I mean, maybe, maybe that was just, you know, something to kind of like appease us, but I don't know. Like I'm kind of thinking some of those guys were true blue and that they (laughs) might have come and that would have just been so amazing. Um, but, uh. And I guess, um, you know, just kind of like going back to your your birthday party, like you had an unbelievable birthday party, March 7th, but the effort that you put into curating it was, it was like a mini festival and the execution was awesome. And I know, you know, being a host of something like that, sometimes you can't really like be at ease, Mm -hmm. Um, but it was something that everybody, well, it will be their highlight of 2020 for sure. (laughs) Like everybody always says that. It's like, oh yeah, we... Last time we saw each other was Jess's party. Yeah, that, like, most amazing event, like, before this whole, like, shit whole thing mm-hmm. happened. Um, I mean, you played, it was just, yeah, that, so mad props to you. Um, I think, th- so the lineup, you had Taran Flowers, Mafarico, um, The Natural Supernatural, um, Sean Fleming, and then Ethan of Strange Brew. Mm-hmm. And then Gil. Gil, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean... You know, and those are things you likely would have probably continued to have, right? Yeah, I know. I was like, this will be the first of many. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> but you're doing some things, you know, um, you know, Anaheim, I know you've uh, curated some things, and it's really nice that um, you're trying to keep that sort of, like, flame alive because um, at least with some musicians, they say, even if they're learning mat- new material, they don't have an audience to sort of, like, test drive it <laughs> to. Um, but anyway, your birthday was amazing. uh, (laughs) I want to have, maybe we can name it something and just make sure that every year, well, we'll align with your birthday. Yeah. I'm like, it could just happen. (laughs) Yeah. Every year around your birthday time. Um, yeah, that was just so unbelievable. I mean, and it's also a testament to just, as I was saying before, in the very beginning, how you've really integrated quickly, um, in the scene. And, um, I mean, it was what, over a hundred people that came, I would assume. Like. I would assume collectively, maybe not all at once, but people that were, oops, because some people came later towards Mm. the night, but I think um, altogether, I would assume it was probably about 100. Um, And then, you know, people like, people that didn't necessarily play, but like a Brenda Carsey, you know, I know you played her um, Wonder and All production Circle Up Mm -hmm. more recently during quarantine. and, um, um, And so... 
I guess getting back to the point of how you integrated, you you mentioned to me that the kibitz room was yes. very fundamental. Oh my gosh! So when I first came out here, I didn't know anyone, and I was kind of like, "This place sucks." I don't have any yeah. friends. <laughs> and then I went <laughs> to the kibitz room, and I was actually too late to sign up for the open mic, so I was kind of also just like, "Well, what was me?" You know. Yeah. And then um, my friend Kimber was there that night. And she was just like, hey, what's your name? Like, super nice and friendly. And then, like, so many other people were nice and friendly. And I, they were like, yeah, let's come back next week, you know? Nice. And then it became just, like, a weekly hang. And I met so many other musicians through there. And then I was always, like, welcome up on the stage. Like, I started doing some Monday nights, a random Saturday night. Like, nice. it was just, like, a place I would test out new songs because it felt like home. Yeah. Um, so that was definitely something that... When I came out here for my internship, I went back, and then I was kind of like, do I move out here? Do I mm. stay in New York? And I was like, Roll the, the kibitz room again. was, like, something that helped motivate me to come back here, because I'm like, that was, that's, that's awesome. a place. <laughs> that's awesome. And I remember you mentioned also meeting Dario of DeBronco there, and, yep. um, but then you said another platform that was more, like, east side LA was uh, at the Lost Night, they had open mic. Yeah, I was on the other side of town, so it was always a hike to get over there, but yeah. I would willingly do it every Tuesday because everyone was so... That was the first open mic I went to where I was like, wow, Whoa, everyone's so, so good. good. Like, usually I'm like, when are they done? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. But, yeah, it was really impressive, and I met... They, yeah, I met so many people there. Yeah, and then Victoria Varaya, you were saying also. Well, that's really nice. I think, you know, like... Obviously, as I was saying before, like coming to the center of the universe, you, you're going to expect that it's going to be like upper echelon of talent. But um, but then looking at it more as like, wow, I aspire to kind of like, be, you know, better myself to be at certain levels is really nice, um, especially where there might be temptation to, to kind of compare yourself against people you know, you sort of look at it more like, um, I know my style and I want to sort of elevate that to my capacity, but, but take in, you know, aspects of other people, what they're maybe doing clever, you know, in a clever, um, sort of aspect, like how can I, cause I always find that you always kind of, um, should I say it's like the company you keep really is kind of what like fuels your fire. Um, and if you're around people that are sort of complacent and not like stressing to grow, um, you'll probably adopt that same behavior. But if mm -hmm. you're in a place like this where everybody seems to really be like, you know, have that sort of flame lit and that hunger, that fire in the belly, like you're going to elevate to that too. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really cool. And then the last night shut down, but then the Tuesday night sort of, I guess, um, migrated to Highland Park mm -hmm. um, with Brenda's open mic night. Um, that's really nice. And then what about, did you ever do things like Silver Lake Sessions or So Far Sounds? No, in fact, <laughs> I was working so hard to get in L.A. So far, sounds I'd done Boston and Portland, and okay. I was like, I'd really love to tap in L.A. because, like, I could just drive there easily, yeah. you know? And then, like, for years, I was trying and never getting responses, and then I finally actually booked one for April. Oh, and, my. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, damn. It uh, didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, damn. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how this all sort of, like, I don't know, kind of resurrects, um, uh, who knows, maybe next spring, summer, but, um, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see <laughs> like, yeah. Cause even some of those things, like, I don't know, it's like, will Treehouse ever come back? Did you ever go to yeah. Treehouse? Yeah. Yeah. All these sorts of things. I mean, it's such a shame again, sort of the, uh, the satellite being like decimated. Um, cause that's something new is, you know, there's going to be yeah. bigger and better. So like we lose some, but we're going to gain some. Exactly. Like, I'm really looking forward to the new things that emerge. Yeah. So Sarah of SMA, she was my last guest and, and she was, the way she phrased it is she's, she said, we're going to have like a golden yeah, age. Yeah. I loved what she said. Yeah. I like, yes. And I was like, yeah, I can, <laughs> Ready. you know, and, and also maybe like some people are just kind of like, maybe like music really wasn't for me. Um, but the people that do sort of, um, you know, resurrect with this hunger, it's like, uh, and maybe, maybe they've been inspired to, um, I don't know, like hone their identity. Like, how do I want to be presented? Um, I, I know one of the things we were talking about earlier is the fact that you've been learning um, to spin fire. And um, and you were so impressive because you, like, flipped the baton behind your back. And I'm like, Jesus, Jess, like, you have such beautiful hair. Do not let your hair on fire. <laughs> um, but maybe, I don't know, there's likelihood that there will be rules against that indoor venues. But maybe, 
like you playing outdoor shows or festivals, you can maybe incorporate that. I don't know. That'd be fun. I, I could probably. Yeah, it's like your secret <laughs> weapon. You know, like you save it for the last few songs and they're like, damn. Um, yeah, no, that would be really cool. Um, speaking of festivals, I know a festival I personally have never been to, but I was going to go this year, was Desert Days and one that you've always... Um, kind of admired and glorified. Uh, is there, I mean, maybe just kind of like summarizing, what is it about that festival that you you like so much? Um, I like how small it is. Like you'll run into the same people you met at a show last night. Yeah. Um, and they usually just have the two stages. So you're not missing out on too much by being at the one stage. And Got when it. there's like the headliner, it's kind of like, you know that everyone's collectively there. there. It's not like, oh, what's going on over there? What's going on over there? It's like yeah. we're all present right here yeah and having that lake right there you could float during the day and watch some of the performances like very nice that was so great yeah <laughs> no that always is really like the most vexing like source of my anxiety when I'm at festivals it's like oh shit like I'm missing this at this stage and this stage mm -hmm. so when you don't have that um you can be more at ease like watching the show and um I think another festival that actually Sean Fleming introduced me to that uh, I did I was at um, two Julys ago uh, was High Sierra Music Fest. And that was so nice is they did stagger it so that you could still catch like on the front end and the stages were small enough that you could migrate. And they also had some artists playing multiple times. Um, and I remember that year Valley Queen actually played, which was really cool because they are personally one of my favorite Los Angeles based bands. Um, but very nice. Uh, well, you know, is there is touring something that maybe you foresee um, I don't know, in 2021 or... I definitely see that. And that's, like, one of the reasons I don't want to get a dog is because I'm like, oh. I want to just be out on the road and I feel like it's not conducive. Yeah. But I definitely see that Yeah. Um, in the future. Nice. Um, I know, because I always see you posting stories about, like, you with dogs. And I'm, and I'm <laughs> like, you are kind of a dog whisperer. But then I thought, yeah, like, but this makes sense that if you plan to be more kind of, again, like the nomad wanderlust that... Yeah, it is a little bit hard, um, you know, especially if you have a dog that's not as, uh, I don't know, nimble with traveling. But um, so speaking of, uh, like, you know, Colorado, some of these places you mentioned, is there a certain place where you'd want to, like, maybe have the heart of your tour be around? Um, like, what about even Austin? Have you done South By? Or? I have not. That's okay. definitely, like, I literally have a little bucket list of, like, places I want to perform, and South By is on there for sure. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, I think, um, and you would probably be fine even like multiple months, right, out at a time being in a car. And yeah, I feel like Sean Forte would probably be up for being <laughs> He'll just like, pack the band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's also somebody very, you know, spontaneous and doesn't need a lot of plans, which I really like. Um, cool. Well, I really hope that does happen because I think, you know, again, um, f fans in various places might not know of your music existing and um and even some of the songs you have that you're working on again they're not on spotify yet so um be nice to kind of test drive some of them in new places and mm -hmm. um and even i mean the pacific northwest i think portland's got a nice little kind of tinier intimate music scene and um there's the one festival called um oh i know nikki Nikki Newman, our, our um, photographer friend, just did it, um, a photograph for it last year. Oh, it's escaping me. But it was a smaller festival that, um, what's his name of, um, oh, it'll come to me. <laughs> it'll come to me. But there's a lot of, you know, Pacific Northwest. And I, I feel like, again, your song, Souvenir, you said you were headed. It was Arcadia, that's North Northern California. Arcadia, yeah. Arcadia. Yeah, and um, also up in that area, um, Sean Fleming does a festival of a year in Mendocino area, and that might also be like another one to consider as kind of a smaller intimate festival. Um, so yeah, um, the other thing I was going to mention just outside of music, you make jewelry, which I think is really cool. Um, and I really like that you make things like out of musical instrument pieces. Mm -hmm. So, um, like guitar picks and guitar strings 
Is that something that you um, have been working on recently or? Yeah, I actually just like, I'm trying to like rebrand it and I'm going to call them Picadelic and try to make them look a little more like psychedelic. And um, I'm trying to use like recycled credit cards and gift cards and things like that because there's enough plastic in the world that I don't want to yeah. create more. Especially I think if you're wearing it on your ears, you're not playing with a guitar. So it doesn't have to be a real guitar pick. So they're mm. just shaped like picks and I paint them and then find like little beads and stuff to go on them. And I'm trying to find ways like, Guitar strings are recyclable. Like, Dajario mm. has a recycling program, but I've looked into it, and it's like you have to have, like, a pound of it or something, and then you have to go bring it. So it's not as easy yeah. as it should be to recycle guitar strings. So um, a friend of mine actually already does this. He has, like, guitar string bracelets that he makes and adds a couple beads cool. and sells that. And it's like, I played these guitar strings, so it kind of has Just that factor to more. it, too. So that's actually one of the things I think is so, you know, I, I was just thinking into the future, if you can sort of like meld your your talent and your interest in making jewelry with like your own merch, it's almost because somebody who I think does that really nice is Lauren Ruth Ward as she does like stamping on scarves of her own, you know, scarves right. that she's worn yeah, or things like that. Yeah, they're unique pieces. I yeah. Love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like, oh my God, you know, after one of your shows, you can have your merch stand and it's like you only have a few delicate pieces of these kind of like um once only you know one only pieces and it's like oh these were the strings I used when I played or I don't know you know name some shows or something like that and that's be really cool you know because it's 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 a souvenir that has the experience and it's not just a tangible you know uh -huh. um I like that a lot um you know it's funny I actually had uh, bought some earrings I think I'm, it was when I was in Africa or something and the person was saying she they were claiming that all of the earrings were made from just recycled goods and it um the earrings had it was like translucent sort of color but then painted uh, with flowers. And I was like, well, what, what is this made out of? And she's like, guess. And I, I like, I don't know, probably like failed miserably. And she's like, CDs, old CDs that were melted. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so we obviously don't use CDs anymore. I don't know if anybody <laughs> still has their CD collection. Even, uh -huh. you know, maybe they don't want to give up, you know, I don't I know. I still sell them. So people still buy them. Really? Like old people? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they want to give away their like ace of base, you know, like, but, uh, but anyway, like that could be another thing. Um, if people are just, you know, all this like trash, um, CD if you're if you're comfortable melting plastic because maybe in that regard you could even put like like JS or something so you have your initials on it mm. and kind of brand it that way yeah I've thought about doing stuff with like old vinyl like I've seen it like Melrose Melrose Trading Post, they have, like, clocks and stuff. Clocks, and, like, I've seen that, cool too. things, and, like, they're, like, cut, like, a skyline yeah. or something. So, yeah. like, that's or like something a I think would be something. really fun. Yeah, I've made yeah. a bowl before. It's, like, you just stick it in the oven, pretty much. And then, like, fold it. And, yeah. yeah. Like a pie <laughs> so crust or something. I could do those, because those are fun, and it's, yeah. like, repurposing, making it useful, because yeah. there's some records I have a feeling people aren't going to listen to anymore, or they're just so worn that you yep. can't even hear it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. So speaking of merch, do you have anything at the moment, like T-shirts or anything? I have enamel pins, and okay. then I have okay. stickers. And okay. That's pretty much it. Like, I don't have a design yet for T-shirts, and plus okay. I feel like there's enough T-shirts in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think I would like to do, like, koozies is something I think would be fun, that's or lighters, nice. or, like, something useful. Lighters um, is a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the stickers are great because you can put them on the back of your phone and chances are a lot of people have their phones like when they're looking at things and then people like will scan, don't even realize that you, but you sort of like subconsciously scan the back of phones. I have a Joshua Tree sticker, but I just, it was one thing that I thought like, man, you know, people, if they have stickers, they should encourage that it's put on the back of phones just because people see it a lot, especially on like public transportation. Not that Los Angeles has a lot of, you know, we don't really have like subway systems like other cities but um but yeah and you know the other thing I thought you um you you make really nice tie-dye so that could almost be like I don't know a theme of your merch as well yeah um yeah well and you mentioned there's enough t-shirts but I do think you know this pandemic people are wearing more t-shirts than they normally <laughs> have been like I certainly yeah. know I mean you probably have seen me wear that damn Lauren Ruth one, wore one. <laughs> like it's like every time I show yeah, up she's like oh my gosh she's uniform. in that shirt again <laughs> like, yeah like it's my quarantine uniform uh -huh. um but uh but no I mean because you're so creative I feel like 
the sky's the limit with your merch kind of um and I think the jewelry thing is something really cool because the only other band actually that I've gotten merch jewelry from was a Scottish band Fright and Rabbit um and it was like um almost kind of like a dog tag um, emblem. And it had, they, it had like one of their, they, they usually use like a double cross. It's like one of their symbols. But I was like, whoa, that's so cool. Cause I don't know, you don't always see jewelry. Mm. And, um, and most of the time people wear multiple jewelry pieces anyway. So, um, well, very cool. Um, a few other things, um, mentioned that house party. Um, in your dream crop. Or, um, oh, so I know uh, one of the things I think I had asked you before was music videos. Mm -hmm. Are you somebody that will maybe want to do a music video for every song? Like, what's going to dictate you doing a music video or not? Um, I don't know. I just don't see a need for it right now in my music. Yeah. I think there's enough digital media out there. Like, I want to try to keep my music live for a while until... Mm -hmm. I have something that'll be more of an art piece. And then in that sense, when I have like a full product, I would definitely want some visuals with it. Even yeah. visuals like while I'm playing, like projected on a screen and that kind of stuff. Oh, that'd be really um, cool. So I definitely want to incorporate visuals with my music. I don't know if it's going to necessarily just be like music video, music video, music, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love like um, Rufus Du Soul just did this like live video out in Joshua Tree where they played like, I don't know if it's their whole album or half an album. Um, and they had all this like lighting rigged up and it was a really cool mm. immersive experience. So I might do something more like that where it's like a whole package instead of just yeah. a three minute yeah. YouTube click. Um, yeah. but we'll see. That's <laughs> cool. I was going to say, uh, we're no strangers to, um, you know, lighting and color fusion with live shows and how that sort of like amplifies and, um, accentuates the, um, um, what should I say? The experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, again, uh, going back to the Lauren Ruth Ward show at Pappy's for Valentine's Day, the... Um, is it Liquid Courage? Why am I saying Liquid Courage? No, that is something else. Liquid Light Show. No, they are Liquid oh, Courage. Oh, Liquid Courage. Show. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's you're right. right. Okay. Well, I was right the that. first time. Damn. Um, and how we were so enamored. And um, it was awesome because I know you were like right behind me um, during the show. And because uh, they had the stenciling and the moving colors. And we, we were the ones that I think were most interested in actually seeing like how that whole sort of... Um, uh, you know, how, how all of that was kind of like put into to motion. And we didn't necessarily realize that in real time she was projecting like, or sorry, dropping like oily paint onto this like projector screen and then kind of like mixing it around with the stencil. But I love that you wanted to know. And I was like, yes, let's go find out. Um, so that was really cool. But yeah, I think something like that would work really nicely with your music. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if you were to adopt the fire spinning, um, <laughs> you know, then you'd yeah. be like, all right, you think this is cool? cool now watch this and like bring out and tour on the fire that would be so <laughs> fucking cool um anyway um yeah no that would be the, really nice and um the other thing is I wanted to put a shout out for you had a recent song um for uh like a, a weed product release yeah it's, it's gonna be THC infused rolling papers that my friend's company is manufacturing and um they wanted to use my song i wrote this song over the summer uh with my friend adriana we were just sitting by the campfire and i'm just playing this little like country like kind of like we're just like weed and then we're like <laughs> wait a second let's write a little song and awesome. like yeah it's just called smoke some weed and then my friend heard it and was like we might use that and i was like wow. what and so i recorded it with jordan ruiz okay. um who's an amazing producer and it's basically like it's pretty much done i just got the masters i'm just waiting to make sure um that uh the company likes the clip that i sent them mm -hmm. and yeah i'm thinking i'm gonna release it on 420 <laughs> nice because <laughs> it seems fitting um so yeah that so gives it'll me be time a little to bit plan. of ways yeah. yeah well and maybe i don't know if, if anybody's willing um maybe you could even do like a little i don't know mini music video or something like that or i don't know I'm just thinking of some of our friends that are super talented videographers. Like, again, a plug to Taylor of Tar and Flowers. He did a recent documentary um, with featuring Josh Arbor, and I was just like, "Holy crap!" Like, not only are you amazing guitarist, but like you do do this too. It's like so many of our friends, as you are, are multi-talented, and um, uh, yeah, I feel like it's it's it'd be um, 
nice to to work with some friends in that regard. But so that's when it and, and when it would be released, it would be released under your name mm -hmm. um, and everything under Spotify. Okay. Um, well, that's you know, it's really great that you're getting exposure to these sort of like I don't know, quote unquote, publishing sort of deals because I think that is where a lot of people will learn about your music, um, either if it's like commercials with a product or um, mm -hmm. I don't know, who knows, uh, TV shows or movies, things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome, very nice. Mm -hmm. Maybe we maybe we can find a place for souvenir because I do think that song is super <laughs> universal. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of people like relate to it. Um, cool. Well, um, I don't know if there's any other like last minute things. Um, the only other funny things I was thinking about, like that was just another funny experience with you is when we were at the echo and we ran into Mac DeMarco. Mm -hmm. We were at, we were seeing Donnie Benet, oh my God. Um, <laughs> who is actually, he's really grown on me, but not a musician I would have expected to run into Max Marco. But what I thought is he was so casual and cool. And when you were mentioning being from upstate New York, he seemed to be really interested in learning yeah. more about that. So he was looking at buying property there. Or something. Yeah. Like, really? Yeah. Why? <laughs> but and I, I guess it is like a little hidden treasure. Yeah. So, um, but again, that's kind of the beauty of, um, you know, our, our positioning in sort of Echo Park Silver Lake is you're kind of like, hmm, I never know who might run in or I might run into at the Echo. And it's just like um, when we were when I was seeing um, uh, um, what's his name? Well, Valley Queen and um, something Wilson. I'm losing it. Um, Gosh, what's his first name? Oh my God, Dario would kill me because it's one of his favorite art oh, Jonathan. artists, Jonathan Wilson. <laughs> um, uh, what's his name was in there? Um, oh, Jackson Brown. Yeah. And so it's just like you have some of these people just show up, right. you know. Pop in. And I know like Sharon Van Etten has popped up at the hi hat. She saw to see like Donna Missile, so. That's pretty cool. So we'll to keep a lookout for, um, usually I feel like Mac DeMarco's wearing that sort of like, um, that hat. What do you, it's, um, oh, hat? what? Is it a bucket Like a bucket hat. hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, well, very nice. Uh, yeah, you know, at least one of the things that we do know, speaking of the Echo, is that will be a venue that after all of this will sort of re revive. Um, but as you said, there's going to be other things that are going to sort of pick up and, um, I at least know I can look forward to your next big birthday. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we can celebrate all the talented musicians that we, that we know and have. And, um, yeah, be able to hear some of, like, your newer stuff, just like this, this weed song. So, cool. Well, um, I don't know. Are there any last comments? Anything that you'd like to, I don't know, throw a plug out <laughs> for? Um, and, I, again, now you're living in San Diego, but hopefully you will be back. I don't know. We'll Maybe see. to be decided. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Because I knew a lot of friends that miss you that were like, what? Jess Jones doesn't live in LA anymore? Just two hours away. I know. I know. You made it up for this, so I'm very <laughs> grateful. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, we'll be looking forward to the 410 new release. And, um, you know, just anything new, uh, I'll make sure to, to bark about you because great friend, but um, also somebody whose music I believe in strongly. So thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, thanks again, Jess. I think we're going to wrap this up. So, um, you know, it was great to have you on my, my fifth Beats That Set My Pulse podcast. And I'll have a little review uh, posted on my Instagram and then my WordPress blog about you and give plugs for some of the songs that we mentioned today. And, um, yeah, we'll have another artist um, in a few weeks, still to be determined. But um, so happy that you were my lucky number five. <laughs> Thanks again. Thanks again.